My name is Carmen de Carvalho Guimarães, but it used to be Carmen Miranda when I was single. Everywhere I went, people would say your name, please, and then I said Carmen Miranda, and they would look at me, Carmen Miranda? Are you a relative of hers? I would say yes, she's my aunt. Meu pandeiro do samba, tamborim de bamba, já é de madrugada. In the case of Carmen, I think that she remains in the memory because of her great talent, extraordinary talent. Everything she created herself, she never imitated. It came out of her. She was a very special human being. Meu pandeiro do samba, tamborim de bamba, já é de madrugada. Carmen Miranda died of a heart attack at her Beverly Hills home on the 5th of August, 1955. She was just 46 years old. When her body was returned to Rio de Janeiro for burial, a crowd estimated at close to a million took to the streets, eager to pay its last respects to Brazil's most famous daughter. In her short life, she'd risen from humble beginnings to become the country's most popular singer, a star of radio and early sound films, before going on to conquer Broadway, then Hollywood, with her exotic, vibrant, and irresistible personality. My friend Fred Astaire thought that she was just tremendous, and so did everybody in the industry. In my opinion, she was the best Brazilian female singer of all time. This glorious smile and this glorious image that was bigger than life. She could light the screen with that smile. She has that glow, the happiness. There's something positive about Carmen Miranda. She wore the cork shoes that were six inches high. The fruit and the hair and the, the gestures and all the necklaces and God knows what. Didn't really understand who she was or where she was from, but thought, I want to go wherever she came from. It looks like fun. America is a country that loves novelty. Carmen Miranda was the greatest novelty of her time. Once an audience sees her, never forgets her. I think Carmen Miranda was made to be a star. She wasn't just a star. She was electric. Carmen Miranda made her Hollywood debut in 1940. More than 60 years on, she remains one of cinema's most enduring icons, often imitated, never matched. Although she became known as the Brazilian bombshell, Carmen Miranda was in fact born in Portugal, in the small village of Marco de Canaveses, on the 9th of February 1909. Christened Maria do Carmo Miranda da Cunha at the Catholic Church of São Martinho da Aliviada, she was just 10 months old when her family emigrated to Rio de Janeiro. At first, they settled in the commercial district of the city. Her father, who arrived ahead of the rest of the family, worked as a barber, and when Donna Maria arrived with their two daughters, Olinda and Carmen, she took in washing to boost the family income. There were more Portuguese in Rio at that time than in Oporto. Rio was the second greatest Portuguese city in the world. You could be born a Portuguese and become a Brazilian and a Carioca with no problem. It was a natural thing to do. When Carmen was six, the family moved to Lapa, a neighborhood of Rio with a strong Catholic tradition. But in 1915, its character was beginning to change. Carmen was raised in the Lapa district, which was a very conservative and Catholic neighborhood in Rio when they moved there, but it, it became a nightlife district full of cabarets and bars and restaurants and uh, brothels. Lapa only slept from 
eight in the morning to four in the afternoon. At this time of the day, Lapak would go back to its Catholic and conservative climate. So Kami was brought up in this kind of dual style of living, very Catholic and very cosmopolitan. At the age of seven, Carmen started attending the convent school of Santa Teresa in Lapa, which had been established to teach the poor children of the region. She was going to be dressed and fed there, which was a great help. She didn't learn much, but she could use her singing, and that was the start of her singing career. When Carmen was 16, she went to work in Rio's commercial district in a store selling ties. She was already dreaming of a career as a performer and kept her colleagues entertained with her singing. Carmen's good looks and lively personality also proved good for business. The smart boys of the time used to go to her shop and make believe they, they were interested in a tie, just to have the young Carmen the, not the tie around her, their necks, so it could be near her. It was at this time that Carmen started dating her first boyfriend, a rower by the name of Mario Cunha. Mario's father owned Rio's famous Flamingo Rowing Club and was well connected in society. The romance lasted seven years, and during this time, Mario introduced Carmen into Rio's most refined circles. Mario Cunha had free access to all smart clubs in Rio, and he took Carmen with him, and Carmen was very well accepted, although she was just a vendor. But she was so, so delicious, that, and she was with Mario Cunha, so they, they accepted her, and she knew how to behave. By now, Carmen's family were renting this two-story building in Rio's commercial district, having moved from an increasingly rough Lapa in 1925. Carmen's mother was an excellent cook and served meals to the local tradesmen. In 1928, one of the guests heard Carmen singing and introduced her to the guitarist and songwriter Josué de Baruch. The Baruch immediately recognized Carmen's enormous potential as a singer and personality. He became her mentor, teaching her popular songs and playing for her at recitals and on radio shows. She was now using the name Carmen Miranda, and in 1929 made her first series of recordings for RCA Victor in Brazil. The second of these was a song called Taí by Joubert de Carvalho. It became the big hit of the Rio Carnival in 1930 and made Carmen a star nationwide. <laughs> It was a gigantic success. It sold in its first year 35,000 copies. With the success of Taí, Carmen instantly became the most famous woman in Brazil. She was just 21. On the 1st of August 1930, she signed an exclusive two-year recording deal with RCA Victor in Brazil. Lucrative live engagements quickly followed, and every Brazilian radio station wanted her services. Radio, of course, made her famous all over Brazil. Radio has that power, and in those years, it was very powerful. In the same year that Carmen started dominating Brazil's domestic airwaves, the country went through a major political upheaval with the right-wing Getulio Vargas coming to power. At the heart of his political ideology was an ambition to foster a sense of Brazilian national identity. He was a populist and he tried to sponsor everything that was Brazilian. And with that came the golden years of Brazilian popular music. The composers that flourish during those years, it's just an incredible number of them. During the 1930s, Carmen recorded nearly 300 songs, most of them sambas. She worked with all of Brazil's best-known composers and helped take the samba into the popular mainstream. 
she always favoured singing sambas by Afro-Brazilian composers and we know that she frequented informal samba gatherings and parties and she was genuinely friends with lots of Afro-Brazilians which for a white woman of Portuguese origin was perhaps unusual at that time so she was always something of an iconoclast really. She didn't really care what people thought and did what she wanted and what she enjoyed. <laughs> Todos os compositores brasileiros queriam escrever para ela e escreveram para ela suas músicas mais lindas, suas canções mais emocionantes, mais engraçadas, o duplo sentido mais estonteante, tudo foi para ela. Carmen's first house, which she bought in 1931, was frequently visited by Brazil's leading musicians and emerging songwriters. They could be absolutely unknown, and it's funny because uh, at her home, she didn't care how she was dressing. She loved to go to the beach, and she, she could be in a swing, swimming suit, or so she would be wearing uh, very tight shorts. She, she had uh, very beautiful legs, and in the 1930s, a much more conservative time, it might be hard for those samba writers who are very humble people being received by that gorgeous woman <laughs> showing their legs for them <laughs> and singing the way she sang. <laughs> in 1933, Carmen traveled to Argentina as Brazil's ambassador of samba. She'd been awarded the title by the Vargas government who were looking to promote Brazilian culture abroad. The Argentinians loved her, and she returned to Buenos Aires many times during the 1930s. But for all her success as a singer, Carmen's greatest ambition was to be a film star. She used to send her picture to the move magazines, hoping to be chosen for one of the few productions. She managed to become friends with people who made movies here, but they never gave, gave her a, a chance until she became a very famous singer. With the advent of sound and Brazilian cinema's first musicals, it was only natural that the country's most popular female singer would finally get her chance. These ready-made stars of the world of radio and popular music provided the ideal film stars for these early uh, Brazilian musicals. So they were a huge box office draw, even before they'd appeared on screen. From 1932 to 1939, Carmen appeared in six Brazilian film musicals, her popularity as a radio and recording star ensuring her easy transition to the screen. Popular cinema was entirely connected with the radio industry and they would love to go to the films to see the images of their popular singers and actors and actresses from the radio on the screen. Sadly, only one of Carmen's Brazilian films survives intact. In the 1936 musical Alô, Alô, Carnaval, she sings two songs, one with her younger sister, Aurora. You can see how they've really been taken from the world of radio and just plonked in front of a camera, really. It's, it's not very sophisticated in terms of camera angles. But you do get a tremendous sense of her kind of star status and her appeal. She really did have a star quality, even in those early days. It was not something that was manufactured later in Hollywood. In 1935, we have this woman very aware of the kinetic powers of the medium, moving from one place to another, making the camera follow her. And when we have a close-up, you have the eyes moving. I think it had a kind of hypnotic power for Brazilian audiences. And perhaps in that sense, she might be ahead of her time. Following Alô, Alô, Carnaval, Carmen made only one more film in Brazil. It proved to be a defining moment in her career. O que é que a baiana tem? O que é que a baiana tem? The extraordinary fruit-crowned creations which became her Hollywood trademark owe their inspiration to the traditional costume of the Afro-Brazilian women of Bahia and to this song which Carmen performed in the 1939 musical Banana da Terra. What Does the Woman of Bahia Have was written by a then-unknown composer named Dorival Caymmi. 
Carminho, o que é que a baiana tem? Carmen é uma, uma importância muito grande na vida dele, porque foi a primeira, é, a primeira música que foi, que foi gravada, foi gravada logo é, pela Carmen Miranda, que era um grande sucesso. Ele estava recém-chegado na cidade do Rio de Janeiro com apenas 24 anos e já foi pinçado para, essa, para, para os braços dessa estrela nacional, né? que muito nos orgulha. The words of O Que Que A Baiana Tem describe the traditional Baiana costume from top to toe. O Que Que A Baiana Tem Tem torso de seda tem Tem brinco de ouro tem Corrente de ouro tem Tem pano da costa tem Tem bata arredada tem Pulseira de ouro tem Tem saia engomada tem Sandália enfeitada tem Só vai no bom fim quem tem Só vai no bom fim quem tem The Baianas were Afro-Brazilian women descended from slaves who in the streets of Salvador in Bahia would have sold fruit and other produce These women literally carried baskets of fruit on their heads and it's this idea that prompted Carmen to actually adapt the turbans that they also wore into her kind of edible turbans, these fruit-laden turbans. Banana de Terra was set on a mythical South American island and although most of the film has been lost, this priceless scene in which Carmen sings O Que É Que Baiana Tem has survived. This was the first time Carmen was captured on film wearing her own version of the traditional Baiana costume. The Baiana, the costume, had been used before. It had been used in shows and had been used for carnival, but no wealthy society girl would wear that. Carmen Miranda, rich as she was at that moment, put it on and showed them that she could do it. She's taking a very ethnically loaded symbol but making it acceptable for a wider audience by virtue of her white skin in a way. Um, so certainly for the Vargas regime, I think that she became kind of the, ironically, the acceptable face of black Brazil. In February 1939, the veteran Broadway producer Lee Schubert arrived in Rio for the annual carnival. Schubert, who together with his brother Sam owned the world's largest theatre empire, had received reports of an exciting samba singer who performed at the then fashionable Casino the Urca. The Schuberts were always in the search of new talent. He had planned to go and take a look at Carmen Miranda. And he liked her and gave her a contract almost immediately. She never knew what she was signing when she signed the contract because the contract was in English. She didn't know a word of English. The contract guaranteed the Schuberts 50% of everything Carmen earned. And over the next three years, it proved to be a very profitable deal for them. However, before leaving Brazil, Carmen did make one demand. She insisted that her own musicians travel with her to the United States. She knew that no American percussionist would do the beat of samba properly. She was having an affair with the leader of Bandalua too. That might have helped. <laughs> Carmen set sail for the United States on the 4th of May, 1939. Her initial contract was for an eight-week run in the new Broadway review, Streets of Paris. She was leaving Brazil, its biggest star, and two weeks later arrived in New York, a complete unknown. Can you imagine what decision it was for Carmen Miranda to leave Brazil to come to the United States? She maybe had this pioneering spirit. Maybe she felt she had to do it, and she felt that she had what it took to do it. When Carmen arrived in New York on the 17th of May, 1939, the biggest show in town was the World's Fair. I remember the 1939 World's Fair as if it were yesterday. So many people from all over the world were going to the World's Fair that people who normally spent their money in New York going to nightclubs or going to the theater weren't doing that. 
Broadway had just emerged from the Great Depression and desperately needed a hit show. It was in this climate that Carmen opened in Streets of Paris at the Broadhurst Theatre on the 19th of June, 1939. Toward the end of Act One of The Streets of Paris, her first Broadway show, she just exploded. I mean, it was just like a piñata that had been smashed and the sparklers went everywhere. And you could hear the audience gasping with joy. Immediately, the reviewers were ecstatic about her, as were audiences, because she was such an unconventional presence compared to mostly what you would see on Broadway at the time. And, of course, she had her wonderful turban on and those flashing eyes. She was instantly a, a, a hit. People would just come to see her. Actors, personalities, Everybody went to see Carmen Miranda. South America, hi, hi, hi. Overnight, she was on radio on Rudy Valley's program, the Fleischmann Hour, and she was just talked about everywhere you went. In South America, hi. Word of the Brazilian bombshell, who was being credited with saving Broadway from the World's Fair, quickly reached the attention of the major Hollywood studios. They were always on the lookout for new acts, and within a matter of weeks, Carmen was signed up to appear in a new musical for 20th Century Fox. Down Argentine Way, actually photographed in beautiful Buenos Aires, captures on the screen the magic spell of this colorful land with its gaiety, happiness, and laughter. And with it all, there's a grand cast headed by dashing Don Amici, bewitching Betty Grable, and the fascinating star of New York's hit, Streets of Paris, the glamorous, exotic Carmen Miranda. Down Argentine Way was filmed while Carmen Miranda was doing Streets of Paris. So she couldn't go to Hollywood to appear in the film. So you see Betty Grable going into a nightclub, and then the camera does a reverse shot, and there is a stage, and there's Carmen Miranda. But of course, she was 3,000 miles away, spliced into the movie. Carmen Miranda. Carmen Miranda was in for the Technicolor movie. She might have been the, the queen of the Technicolor. She was a natural for all those beautiful, exploding colors on the screen. <laughs> For a studio like 20th Century Fox, what could be more appropriate for their Technicolor films than to have somebody who was exotic, dressed in all these wonderful flashing costumes, and had this very vibrant personality? Although she only performs three songs in Down Argentine Way, they made Carmen an instant box office hit in America. But the reaction to the film in Brazil, and Argentina in particular, was less favorable. They didn't like the way they were portrayed in the film. The actors were speaking with Mexican accents, and that they didn't like that. And uh, there were scenes, it was rather obvious jokes that were offensive. So Argentina decided to ban this film and made quite a big nasty incident, diplomatic incident. What part Brazil was to play in the war depended upon the decision of its president, Getulio Vargas, a man distrusted by many liberal Americans. They knew Vargas to be a dictator. Ruling for by 1940, Brazil, like Argentina, was aligning itself with Hitler and the Axis states. Carmen, who was now firmly established as one of America's most marketable stars, returned to Rio in June that year to attend her sister Aurora's wedding. Sensing a propaganda opportunity, the Vargas government helped stage manage a crowd of around 100,000 people to welcome her home. Her first professional engagement was a charity gala at the Casino de Urca, in front of President Vargas and a hand-picked audience. 
she entered the stage and she said, hi, people, <laughs> instead of, oi, oi, gente, oi, macacada. And they were furious because Carmen came back Americanized, as they say. People really didn't applaud, you know, didn't clap, and they just remained silent. And that made her very sad. Some Brazilian journalists also, they were jealous because she was really a success in the United States, and they wrote things about her that were not uh, made her sad. Place yourself in that position. Your country is your home, it is your mom and dad, your sisters and your family. And what do we want most in the world? And that is to please and get the affirmation that you're doing the best you can. It was a couple of months before Carmen felt ready to perform in public again. When she did, she answered her critics with a song she had specially written for the occasion. <laughs> She put on a show with songs that were strictly samba. No English spoken, no American songs, strictly samba, and making fun of what had happened. And they loved her. And so she left in very good graces, but very scarred. Having answered her Brazilian critics, Carmen returned to the United States in October 1940, finally arriving in Hollywood at the end of the year. She'd been signed up by Daryl F. Zanuck's 20th Century Fox for a series of Technicolor musicals set in exotic South American locations. Inspired by this city of enchantment and filmed in glorious Technicolor, a magnificent motion... The idea was to create a mythical Latin American background. Tropical colors, bounty, you had nature to be full of fruits and, and, and flowers and, and, and colors. And, um, it was totally artificial. You'll want to sing and sway to the tantalizing tunes by Matt Gordon and Harry Warren, starring Alice Faye, dashing debonair Don Amici in his finest role, and the exotic, fascinating new screen sensation, Carmen Miranda. Carmen quickly became a poster girl for America's good neighbor policy, which looked to build closer political and economic relations with its neighbors to the south. Our sensibility as a nation had almost never been involved with South America. The thing that made us absorb South and Central American culture more was World War II, when the movie industry lost its European market due to the war. So we had to sell our movies somewhere, and economics in this country always seemed to win out. It's that vitality, that kind of joie de vivre that she has, that we like to think exists somewhere. South America is fun. Brazil is music. Yeah, she's a walking poster for Brazil, isn't she? <laughs> Come on and sing. The tick -a -tick -a -boom -tick. Zanuck was very astute at judging talent. <laughs> And he knew that within a musical that he always needed specialty performers or people that could do numbers that would goose up the proceedings and take some of the burden off the stars. And uh, as a specialty star, she was right up there with the top. Carmen's speciality act was proving to be popular with cinema audiences, and as early as March 1941, her enormous box office success was recognized when she became the first South American artist to be honored outside Mann's Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Later the same year, she took a starring role in Weekend in Havana. Would you like to spend the weekend in Havana? How would you like to see the Caribbean shore? Go 
them all around the way over sundry to where the view and the music is tropical. To win in Hollywood, she must be funny. She would be well loved if she was funny instead of, uh, of a, a vamp, as all the Latin women used to be. I am told you're upstairs, you're a blonde. But there are many blondes upstairs. If you stand next to a woman, it is 35 to 1, she is a blonde. It was not 35 blondes, it was one blonde. Her comedy skills are wonderful in, in Weekend in Havana, the way she um, acts with Cesar Romero. You are a thief. No good, good for nothing. Uh, but I like you. Mm. Oh, no, no. One more kiss and I'll forget how to dance. At that time period, in that part of history, it would not be appropriate by American standards to have a South American person having a romance with a white Caucasian. They wouldn't accept it. And so as part of her character role, she was always the clown, the sidekick. She might be involved in the main story, but if she was going to have a love interest on the screen, it would be someone who's clearly demarked as, well, he's from South America, he's from Cuba, he's from Mexico. No! Let me search you! With me, it is a question of dignity. Can't you wait until you're asked? No! No! Rosita, damn it! No, me ask! Wait, wait, wait. Come back here! When she first came here, she knew very little English, but that became so cute. It's so interesting. People are charmed by the way she spoke uh, or misspoke. Then I'll sit and wait until the cows go home. Sometimes she'll have to come back. Maybe Monty will not like her so much without any hair. She was told by the studios to actually kind of exaggerate and ham up the kind of Latina accent. It was something that became part of her. But when she talked to people, you know, out of the studios and out of the shows. Her English was perfect. Very, very good. There was a time when she forgot to speak bad English and she was speaking normally with somebody. And there was a newspaper man in the vicinity and he took notes. Well, what are you, what, what's this? You speak very good English. And she, she answered, you don't dare to quote Carmen Miranda without an accent. <laughs> Vou explicar que é o tchata no cachuchu. Chuchu é um trem que vai, que vai me levar perto de alguém. Carmen's larger-than-life on-screen personality and exotic costumes disguised the fact that she was just five foot one. Perched on top of her six-inch platform shoes, which she'd had specially created for her when she was still in Brazil, she became a fashion icon and pin-up in the United States. The shoes were not only used in, on stage. She wore them all the time, even in the house. Never slippers, always the shoes with the high heels. Even the supposed slippers would be the high heels. Although Carmen was a popular figure at the studio, she liked to escape to her Beverly Hills home rather than socialize with the Hollywood set. She lived with her mother, who had returned with her to the United States in 1940. Other long-term house guests included her sister, Aurora, and her family. When she came to Hollywood, she brought her mother with her, Doña Maria. She was, the Portuguese side of Carmen Miranda was there all the time. Number 616 Bedford Drive quickly became the address for Brazilians to visit when they were in L.A. I think that before going to the consulate, they would go to her house. She would always receive them as part of the family. And she would invite them for lunch, she would invite them for dinner, she would invite them to go to the swimming pool. And they really enjoyed, you know, the stay there. I think she missed aspects of Brazil, the happiness, the spirit of Brazil that she gave us. But I think she missed having it around her. And that's why she was so giving and so open to Brazilian artists going by LA or staying with her. Behind her lively on-screen personality, Carmen was a hard-working professional who always put in the hours, as her band members discovered. Joe Carioca and I, he once told me that she was absolutely incredibly professional. 
They would go for rehearsals and keep going, going, going for hours. And they were like so tired. They would think, this is it, we can go home. Should say, okay, one more time. Let's make sure that we really have it. Producers and directors had only praise for her. She was always punctual. She was always ready for the takes. She was working with the heavy costumes, the platform shoes, the, the, the heavy hat, and they thought she would be tired. And Carmen said, no, 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 another take. I don't mind. I'm ready. In 1943, 20th Century Fox released The Gang's All Here, directed by Hollywood legend Busby Berkeley. Berkeley had made his name at Warner Brothers with a string of hit musicals like 42nd Street and Footlight Parade, and his elaborate production numbers were ready-made for Hollywood's most colorful personality. The beginning, you see the, the ship and the fruit coming down from the ship and Carmen Miranda coming from under the fruit. That's a fantastic beginning for a film. And there are other wonderful song and dance moments in that film. If you want you can rhyme a bit, bazooka, but you can't fo-fo paduka. That's the northern name for paradise. I wonder why does everybody look at me and then begin to talk about the Christmas tree. I hope that means that everyone is glad to see the lady in the tutti frutti hat. That number, the lady in the tutti frutti hat, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, with all the connotations, you know, the Freudian bananas and the camera, the way it moves, it's just absolutely wonderful. musical comedy of the 20th century from 20th Century Fox that makes all the best musicals. The image that everyone has is the gang's all here, where she's doing her famous number, Busby Berkeley number, the lady in the tutti frutti hat. Tell me that my hat is high because I will not take care It looks like her turban goes up for about 50 or 60 feet with all the bananas in it. I do that song for Johnny Smith and he is very happy with the lady in the tutti frutti hat. After this unforgettable appearance in The Gang's All Here, Carmen would forever be the lady in the tutti frutti hat. It was just four years since she'd first put on the Bayana. But behind the fun-loving image, Carmen was having problems. As early as 1940, while filming down Argentine Way, she collapsed on set, suffering from exhaustion. To help her through her punishing work schedule, she'd started taking a cocktail of prescription drugs. There was a big trend in those days to medicate people for things that perhaps had a lot more to do with, with stress, a busy work schedule, um, social commitments, even their kind of psychological state that could have been dealt with with therapy. It was just easier to kind of give drugs to cope with everything from sleeping too much or not enough to working too much or not enough. I guess it was January or February 1940 when she took her first pill. Her body reacted very well to that pill. It was a uh, Benzedrine. It was the, the, the upper of the time. A few days later, she found out she couldn't sleep. So she, <laughs> they gave her a downer. It didn't take a long time for her to get into a pattern of needing these drugs basically to survive, to get up in the morning and go to bed at night. As well as her addiction to prescription drugs, Carmen was now suffering bouts of depression. Even so, she kept up a hectic schedule of filming, live performance and advertising work. During the Second World War, she also joined the ranks of Hollywood stars who entertained the American forces. She was a favorite with the troops and enjoyed having fun with the character she created. Well, fellas, you know how I feel about you. I am... Um, I am... Um... I, 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 I like you very much. I, 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 I think you're grand. Why, why, why is it that when I feel your touch, my head starts to beat, to beat the band? In 1945, her income was rated 
is over 200,000, which made her one of the highest paid females in the whole country. Uh, part of that was not just her film activity, but was from her recordings and her club work and other income that she was able to generate because she also did merchandising of some of her fashion wear. So she was a very smart cookie. Would you like my hips? Do hips not thighs? You easy, see, 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 see the moon above. Way, 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 way up in the blue. See, 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 senor, I think I fall. The fact that she became the highest paid woman in Hollywood in that era for a Brazilian woman of limited education, I think is, is incredible. That shows a tremendous savvy um, and intelligence and, and a kind of a real kind of understanding of what made Hollywood tick. Ironically, it was the end of the Second World War that signaled a change in fortunes for Carmen. Hollywood had new stories to tell and turned its back on the escapist, feel-good movies in which she'd starred. Technicolor gave way to film noir, and Carmen's last films for Fox were made in black and white. They wanted to save money on some of these films that Carmen were doing, and they felt that maybe she, one, had been a little bit overexposed, two, she had gone through a periods of illness in 43 and 44, both from having a little bit of plastic surgery, she had stomach ailment from which she almost died from, and she was having emotional problems that uh, got her very depressed. And so maybe they decided that uh, this was a safer way to go, that use up her contract, but let's not spend a lot of money. In 1946, Carmen invited her sister Cecilia and 10-year-old daughter Carminia to stay with her at her Beverly Hills home. Carmen had now left 20th Century Fox and was about to start work on an independent film for United Artists. Carminia remembers the time fondly. My mother and Aurora, my godmother, they want me to go to school. But she would do like that and then come with me and then I would go with her to the studio. And so, in the, because of this, I, I watched, I saw most of the uh, film of Copacabana. And I remember that when she got home, she would say, oh, imagine, I'm going to, to make the part of a, a French woman, and I'm going to sing in French. Can you imagine? She was very, very happy about it. So she really enjoyed doing Fifi. Je vous aime, mon petit, je vous adore. Plenty of pepper, huh? And a nice shake it. It was black and white. She played dual roles, which was interesting to a degree. Groucho Marx was not at his best, and it was just sort of a mediocre picture and not really a good showcase for her. With a little haste and ingenuity, you arrive upstairs to do your numbers, Mademoiselle Fifi. Or is it Con No, it's no, it's Fifi. It's 10.38. Now at 10.41, you run... Wait a minute. 10.38, 10.41, three minutes are missing. What do I do with the three minutes? Don't you think we need a little time together? Also on the set of Copacabana was assistant to the producer, David Sebastian. It's heaven! Why didn't you tell me about this ten years ago? He had no, no defined profession, no job in view. He was only in the crew of Copacabana because uh, he has a brother who, ha who invested some money in the film and uh, he wanted to be sure that not only Carmen Miranda but Groucho Marx would go on the stage and on time and, and don't cause any unnecessary delays. So David Sebastian was put there just to watch Carmen. And in watching her, he saw a very lonely woman, kind of desperate woman, very rich woman, let me ask you something. What's he got that I haven't got? Well, he's young, he's handsome, he's strong. He's Stop. I, I, I would draw the question. I heard her say that she needed a man to be at her side because she felt lonely when she had to travel. She needed a man to take care of her contracts and everything. And so she thought he was that kind of a man. Olé, olé. 
wedding samba will bring a timid senorita to her feet. Carmen Miranda and David Sebastian were married at the Church of the Good Shepherd in Beverly Hills on the 17th of March, 1947, just a matter of weeks after they'd first met. The time the beat of a samba is always in the air And everyone knows it's the yes, the time in judgment She started to think, I'm, I'm 38, almost 39 now. I, I, if I want to have a child, it must be now, so I want to marry fast. She wanted a family. She didn't have a family because she didn't get the right man. But I think it was her idea to have a child. It took her a year and a half to get pregnant. As soon as she got pregnant, she was the most happy woman in the world. She told everybody she, she, she canceled all her future dates. She got pregnant, but she lost the child. And uh, that was it. If she married Sebastian only to have a child, and after that miscarriage, she was told that she would never get pregnant again, that marriage immediately lost its little sense. He never fit in her household. He never fit in Carmen's life. The cultural differences were so enormous that were impossible to breach. They grew far, further and further apart with time, and he did lots of damage to her. To add to her marriage problems and ongoing addiction to prescription drugs, Carmen was now drinking, and her health had begun to suffer. But in 1948, she left America for Europe, and a tour which included a month-long season at the London Palladium. Bursting on London's palladium is the Brazilian bombshell Carmen Miranda. Backstage to ask a few questions on your behalf is Pathé's reporter. Tell me, Carmen, do you make all these yourself? Yes, I design all my hats and all my dresses. Where do you get ideas for such extraordinary creations? Well, you see this one with the bananas. Yes, you I see do. see the bananas? Yes. The pineapples and things. Well, this I am um, in Brazil in Bahia. The girls carrying a basket with the fruits in their heads. In the boats that took her to Europe, she had to be anesthetized, anesthetized to, to be able to sleep. The, the usual pills were not doing anything anymore, so the, 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 the doctor on board had to, to give her a shot. Even when she felt sick, she would go on stage, you know. And uh, that required a lot from her. Because when she was on stage, you wouldn't say that she was sad or that she was depressed, you know. She was Carmen all the time. Carmen, there's one thing I'm very curious to know. What do you keep under this exotic turban? Aha, uh -huh, you don't believe I have any hair, do you? Huh? Oh, may I see you? You want to see it? I do. You really do? See? It's my own hair. I like it very much. You know why? Because sometimes I walk in the streets in Hollywood and the people look at me and they say, she look like Carmen Miranda. And they say, don't be silly, she's too young to be Carmen Miranda. And I have a lot of fun, you know. But anyway, this is not my natural color. They bleach it in Hollywood. They change the color of my hair. But I have a lot of fun. But don't forget, people, I make my money the bananas. You know that. I make my money the bananas. So, very glad to bleach you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> In 1948, Carmen also appeared in A Date with Judy alongside a fresh-faced Elizabeth Taylor. It was the first of two films she made for MGM. You've got a date with a big, colorful, song-filled, star-studded extravaganza. Nobody seemed to know quite what to do with her. You know, they tried to give her a role opposite Wallace Beery in A Date with Judy. Somehow it just didn't quite work. Now watch the hip. Watch the hip. Yeah, I am. I am. She hadn't had m many chances in this movie. They used her in one or two songs. She, she's not very well. Ah, that's the kind of the music I like it. It talks to my skin. I'm a jitterbug and I'm as hot as a pipe. I want to tell you, brother, I'm the Bobby Fox type. I'm a red tomato and I'm overly right. Even in those pictures where she wasn't the main star, she certainly had good production values, and she certainly bolstered the picture. 
You could see the difference when she went to Paramount and did her last picture, Scared Stiff, Martin and Lewis remake of an old Bob Hope picture, and the production values were not very good, and the picture itself was just mediocre. They're going through their paces. It wasn't very uh, inspired in any way. And so you just watch that and you say, oh, this is not the way Carmen should have gone out of movies. Scared Stiff, released in 1953, was the last of 14 films Carmen made in Hollywood. She was as busy as ever with a hectic schedule of live performances, but it was a new medium that was now attracting her attention. And there it was, another post-war wonder right before your eyes. Television. Carmen made many guest appearances on American TV during the early 50s and dreamt of having her own show. But her struggle with addiction and depression finally got the better of her towards the end of 1954. Her mother was finally very worried and she wrote to Aurora, there must be something wrong with Carmen, she doesn't want to work anymore. So you must come here to see what's happening. So Aurora went to the States at the end of 1954 and she was appalled at the, the, the vision, uh, at what she saw, Carmen absolutely defeated. Carmen was put on the plane as though she was a little animal. She was doped and she didn't know what they were doing with her and she must have made that trip uh, practically unconscious. By the time the plane landed in Brazil, Carmen, ever the professional, had prepared herself for the waiting crowd. When she arrived here, she came in that red suit of her, and she tried to talk to everybody and to smile, because I believe that even depressed the way she was, she felt that she was back to Brazil, something that she had wanted to do for a long time. She was taken to the Copacabana Palace Hotel in a wing is separated for her. She spent the next 41 days in this room trying to dry up and to clean up her, her body. The doctor took care of her. Nobody could enter the room. And she was clean. Her system was clean from all those medicines. It must have been horrible, the, the withdrawal from, from all those years of taking all those medicines. It must have been horrible. This is in an era before, you know, proper support for, for people going into rehabilitation. So she, she went cold turkey um, and she did this in the surroundings of, of her home where she had started. And although in some senses this might have been a healthy thing to have the support around her, in another sense it may have also been almost a humbling experience for her to have to go back in that state. My mother and I, Aurora, we were all the time with her. She was very, very depressed. It was very sad to see her like that. But she talked to us, you know. She was okay. She could talk. I have read a few letters when she talks about the fears that she had going out of the room, the fears going into the street. She was going through hell in that room inside the Copacabana Palace. One of her friends, he would go there every day with a big, big box of, of ice cream for her, you know. And all this love that people gave her was really responsible for her getting better each day. In the end, Carmen spent four months recuperating in Rio and was ready to stay longer but David Sebastian had been busy setting up work for her back in the United States. On the 4th of April, 1955, and against the advice of her doctors, Carmen flew back to America. She went to work immediately. She spent a week in Havana, singing at the Tropicana. She had several health problems. She, she fainted, she passed out uh, several times. And then she went to work in Las Vegas. And she had a date to a television show with Jimmy Durante. During the taping of the show, which was a very taxing thing to do because she had to dance very heavily. Wait a minute, stop the 
music. Stop the music. Stop the music. Her knees failed her, and she almost fell. She recuperated, and she made a joke. Hi, I have a wonderful idea. Come on, have a breath. Wait, I'll take your lunch. Come on, all right, come here, boys. Come on, all right, all right, come over here, boys. Her last image in the show is so beautiful. Good night, Carmen. Good night, Jerry. Good night. She goes dancing backwards toward the door and saying goodbye to, to the audience. It was her final goodbye to the mass audience. Nobody knew that she had a heart ailment. She went home and there were friends there and they drank and she sang and she stayed up until two in the morning and then she went up to her room and died there. So she kept being Carmen Miranda until the last minute. There was an absolute shock in the whole population. That was absurd, Carmen Miranda dying. All the radios immediately started to play her records again, and there was an immediate uh, uh, movement to, to bring her back to be buried here. It took eight days from the day of her death for her to arrive here in Brazil. When she arrived, all the stores closed. There were people on the streets from the airport until the chamber of deputies where the coffee would remain for the visit of the people who wanted to see her for the last time. I think I had 10 or 11 years old. When I saw that she died, I went into that family and went to see her in the car. I never did this in my life. I went into a family to see a person dead, but I went to see her. It was a coincidence. When she left the chamber of deputies to the cemetery, again, the streets were full of people. All the streets on the way from downtown Rio to the cemetery of São João Batista in Botafogo uh, were crowded with people singing her songs. When you look at the footage of not that many years before in Brazil, and she's so fresh-faced, so beautiful, just such a waste. She just seems a very, very genuine person, perhaps too genuine and sensitive for the Hollywood that she was having to deal with. She was here to show her art, and her, her art was very, very different, and uh, she lived for that, you know. And I think this is why she, she is loved.